Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's webinar on preventing external parasites from bugging your cattle. I'm Ellen Crane, Extension Coordinator for the Beef Cattle Research Council, and I'll be your moderator for tonight. This session will last for approximately one hour, but may go longer depending on the number of questions you've got for us later on during the question and answer period. If you're on Twitter, tweet along with us tonight using the hashtag BeefWebinar. We are recording this session and I will email out the link to the recording to everyone that registered in a couple of days. So if you miss hearing anything tonight and want to watch it again later, you can. Of course, you'll be able to hear and see tonight's presenters, but we can't hear or see you. If you want to communicate with us, type into the small chat window in the control panel on the bottom of your screen. If you have a question or comment for me or either of tonight's presenters, please, that is the place to do so. And feel free to send any questions that you have throughout the presentation. If your internet connection is a bit slow tonight, it might help to close in other programs that are using internet as well as close your webcam window, uh, which means you won't be able to see us, but hopefully you'll make the audio come through a bit more clear for you. This is what we will be covering tonight. You will hear from two speakers that will be speaking about external parasites in beef cattle. And then we will open things up to question and answer at the end of the hour. So with that, let's get started. Our two speakers for tonight are Jean Durgasoff and Katrin Roshan. Sean is a research scientist at the Lethbridge Research and Development Center with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. His research examines the relationship between blood feeding arthropods, including ticks, mosquitoes, and midges, the animals they feed on, and the environment to reduce animal health issues and livestock production losses. He has studied the geographic distribution of ticks, tick paralysis, and the effects of environmental conditions on tick activity and survival. His current studies involve the identification of vertebrate hosts of several mosquito and biting midge species. We also have Katrin Roshan. She is an associate professor of veterinary and wildlife entomology at the University of Manitoba. Her research program is focused on insects and ticks as vectors of livestock and wildlife pathogens. Prior to joining the Department of Entomology, Katrin was a postdoctoral fellow at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lethbridge where she worked on Rocky Mountain wood ticks. Her past research includes work on flies and their ability to transmit bacteria and viruses in cattle, swine, and poultry operations. Currently, her research has an emphasis on distribution and ecology of American dog ticks and black leg ticks. So with that, I'm gonna hand things over to you, Sean. Okay. Well, I first want to thank uh, the BCRC for inviting us to participate in their webinar series. Um, so we'll get uh, my screen shared here. And uh, we'll start, we will talk about some specifics about, um, uh, specific examples about livestock pests and their control. Uh, first of all, we'll talk about some background information and general information on livestock pest control here. And starting off, um, they want to look at um, uh, what is a parasite, first of all. I mean, pretty basics, the basics um, of what we're talking about. But um, important to understand is that they're really living organisms that are usually small that live at the expense of another organism and that it lives on or near. And so when we're talking about ectoparasites, those are just ones that live on the outside of the host, but really harm the host, um, either with brief visits to feed, or sometimes they spend a lot of their lifetime on, on those animals and causing direct harm. Now, in, uh, for cattle ectoparasites uh, in Canada, um, there's at least 13 different types of ectoparasites that really affect beef cattle. And um, a lot of these different uh, parasites could cause a lot of similar problems, um, 
even, for example, um, uh, hair loss, we see can be caused by uh, mange mites and or else either by lice. So those uh, symptoms look similar, even though very different uh, organisms. I'm just going to go full screen here. Um, sorry, here. Okay, so on this uh, uh, list of um, ectoparasites here, they represent a few different groups of pests. Uh, a lot of them are blood feeding insects and ticks and closely associated with hosts and uh, cause direct damage. Um, some are flies that are associated with waste and spend a lot of time in their environment. Um, we also have um, some small parasites that remain on their host too. So very different um, life cycles and biology. And part of the problem with some of these is that they can be very difficult to tell apart. You when you're looking at them, uh, get a chance to look at them closely. And they also have a wide range of effects on their animal hosts. Anything from, first of all, just affecting the animal um, health and welfare by directly causing pain and irritation uh, from sometimes from biting. And so these can really lead to uh, um, stress and potential injury. And so animals under heavy fly pressure, for example, can change their feeding behavior and patterns of grazing um, to avoid flies. Um, it's going to have, happen also um, mosquitoes and which also then affects um, the rate of weight gain and total weight gain and also affects milk production in cows and so then also affects calf uh, weight gain. So you do end up with production losses with some of these uh, external parasites. Um, some of the other, uh, some of these parasites too also can act as vectors so they can transmit pathogens between infected and healthy animals. Um, sometimes We've got two different types of uh, pathogen transmission. There's biological transmission. So that's when the, um, the pest is actually a host to these pathogens. And you get amplification of, of the uh, pathogens, and then they can transmit to another animal. Or you get mechanical transmission, which is, is short, happens over a shorter period of time, where you um, get spread of a pathogen from um, from one host to another um, just by carrying them basically to the other host. And there are quite a long list of uh, pathogens that different species of uh, parasites can transmit. Um, we have everything from uh, bovine aplasmosis, some viruses that cause a hemorrhagic disease. Um, some other uh, flies can transmit pink eye or eye worms, a parasite that gets into the I have cattle, um, and of course, a lot of these can also affect humans. And one of the other major problems that we have with some of these ectoparasites is that they're a real annoyance and nuisance, and so they can lead to uh, complaints and potential lawsuits. And so for all these reasons, um, pest control can be an important consideration in beef cattle production. And so when we're looking at control, um, really the goal is to reduce harm to the livestock, um, whether it's a, a nuisance or injury or actual disease to reduce production, uh, production losses. Now it doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna try to eliminate the pests, but at least reduce uh, numbers so that none of these things happen. And to do that, um, we're looking at something called integrated pest management. And so this is when you're using multiple different control methods uh, together to really reduce the number of pests uh, below kind of a threshold, a point where you would uh, lose money, uh, called an economic threshold. And so these should really involve uh, various some preventative measures to 
um, keep pest levels down, the number, actual number of pests, and then treatment options for when um, they become such a large number that they're uh, a problem for the livestock. Um, so, and then the decision to treat uh, can often be based on an economic threshold or some kind of treatment threshold with the number of insects um, affecting the livestock um, actually cause a reduction in um, uh, or, or losses, economic losses, or potential to uh, too much harm to the animals too. Unfortunately, sometimes this information is not available to make good decisions on. So there's a real lack sometimes of, of information for economic thresholds. Now there's multiple steps to um, integrated pest management. And we're gonna go through uh, at least four of them here. And the first step is really to assess the uh, pest populations, the problem that you may have. Now, one of the things is to make sure you can detect and identify the pest. So you wanna know what they are, um, also how many there are. Um, the abundance is important consideration in this uh, to know whether it's appropriate to treat. And so uh, some of the considerations are determining whether or not uh, suitable development sites or habitat for the pests are present. Um, you can monitor for the pests uh, to identify and determine abundance using traps or um, sometimes visual just observation. Um, you can look uh, along that lines, you can look at animal behavior for indications of problems. And then again, really understanding where, when it's worth treating, uh, what the thresholds are. And so, for example, here, uh, these flies that are um, on this slide here, um, the four different types of flies, any of them can affect beef cattle in some areas of the country. And it's important to know what types they are because um, they can impact the animals differently and the control strategies differ. The second step is to really evaluate your options for uh, prevention and control or actually and treatment. Um, and we have three different, um, three different uh, types of control options. You got a biological, cultural, and chemical. And the uh, biological and cultural control uh, methods are really important because they are meant to reduce the frequency and the intensity of uh, pest population outbreaks. So that redu really reduces the need and dependence on chemical control methods, um, which are really used after pest abundance increases. So biological control um, is done using uh, living organisms that kill the pests, so they may be predators or parasites of the pests. Uh, cultural control methods include practices that reduce um, sites that are favorable for pest development. Um, so this is a real important consideration uh, in pest management and should um, includes a focus on uh, sanitation, uh, water and manure management. Um, these are areas where um, a lot of pests really like to develop the lay eggs and develop. Um, and also pay attention to uh, uh, other development sites like along fence lines, silage mounds, and uh, areas where um, there's spilled feed. Uh, chemical control, um, this of course is a common and important method of, of controlling pests, uh, but really you need to consider the timing um, of application, uh, the mode of application, there's different methods of course, and the class of insecticide that's being used. Um, some of these types, of course, you're also looking at whether or not there's a long-term efficacy or short-term um, based on, and also based on the activity uh, of the uh, pest, the time of uh, year that they occur, and the duration, and also some of these withdrawal periods. Um, so we'll expand on some of these control methods 
um, kind of want to re reference some specific pests and give examples uh, later on in the presentation. And the third step here is really implementing um, these control methods uh, once you've determined what's uh, appropriate for your situation. Um, these in, um, include the prevention and mitigation methods we uh, already mentioned um, and using biological control and cultural control methods along with the various treatment um, maybe insecticide treatment methods like ear tags and, and uh, porons, um, spray um, applied insecticides and, or ear tags. And the fourth uh, step is to monitor the pest population following implementation. So you wanna evaluate the effectiveness of the measures that you're using. Um, you want to know if it works, so you watch for pest abundance, if it, they rebound or if they actually went down, and if there's resurgence of the pest and determine whether or not you need to treat again and when. And you can use things like uh, um, to detect the pests, uh, traps, and, and also watching animal behavior. So what are the... Um, various considerations in general for pest management. And um, uh, a lot of these involve um, the life cycle of the pest um, and the feeding behavior and, and also where these pests uh, like to develop. So really a consideration of the vegetation in the area. And again, water and manure management. And these are habitats that are used by the pests uh, for reproduction. And so managing these can uh, be important for disrupting the life cycle of uh, pest insects and suppress the populations. Um, so really it's important to note that while a lot of uh, pests differ in a lot of ways, some are similar in these life cycles or how they use um, maybe the environment and where they spend their time. So sometimes making certain uh, management decisions, you can help control more than one pest at a time. Um, it's also important to remember that uh, some pests that are a problem in some areas of the country um, aren't in others, so it varies depending where you are, um, also the type of production system that you're working in, and also the time of year. So for example, here we've got uh, a list of um, variety of types of uh, ectoparasites, along with kind of an indication of where uh, these uh, ectoparasites are active in the life stage where they're a problem. And so you can see that um, your cattle can really face um, a lot of different uh, parasites at any one time. And also both um, kind of the profile of parasites will change throughout the year so that at different times. So depend, and also this timing changes uh, depending on where you are in the country. So there's some differences depending on temperature and, and uh, when the seasons, uh, when the snow comes off and spring starts and, and, uh, and uh, changes in uh, temperature for a lot of the, uh, um, one of the key issues. And so there's also one consideration with uh, some of these that overlap too, sometimes they're active at different times of the day. So this means that cattle can have long periods of uh, time where they get a lot of irritation from the pests uh, throughout the summer or other parts of the year. And grazing cattle especially can sometimes have very little rest. And so this really can lead to a lot of production losses just because of the change in, in behavior and feeding um, and the lack of, uh, and their inability to uh, gain weight as well because of that activity. Um, and you'll notice also some pests, like lice, for example, don't really go away throughout the year, but they're more of a problem during certain periods of the year, uh, but they're not really eliminated. So again, at certain times of year, depending on um, um, how the animals 
are, are um, not behave and the closeness. Um, sometimes you get the greater intensity during the winter time for those, but um, when it seems like the problem is going away, that doesn't necessarily mean that the pest is gone. Um, you have animals sometimes that are carriers and they remain sources um, for uh, uh, to transmit the lice to um, other individuals. And some pests um, are a problem mainly in grazing systems and sometimes, and others uh, primarily in confined uh, systems. So, and then others can um, affect animals in both types, but to varying degrees. Um, and so during this seminar or this webinar here, we're not gonna go into in depth into all these different types of um, uh, ectoparasites, but we'll talk about a few examples um, particularly ones that are kind of most damaging or most common in uh, uh, a lot of parts of Canada. So those include um, horn flies and stable flies, which can be a, a problem in different types of systems here, whether confined versus uh, grazing uh, systems and ticks and lice. So first of all, we'll start with uh, uh, talking about horn flies, which are uh, mainly a problem in pastures and rangeland. Um, but these are one of the more, most damaging for economically um, for uh, cattle producers. And so again, we'll go back to the first step in IPM where we need to assess uh, pest populations. Uh, we wanna know what is there again and kind of an abundance to get an idea of the degree of the problem. And so we can look at um, Again, suitable, is there suitable habitat? Um, these require uh, fresh, undisturbed manure, um, standing water, those type of things. Um, are you seeing changes in animal behavior? Um, you can, so you can observe your animals. Are flies visible on them? Um, are they behaving in a way that sh um, indicate that they're ir irritated by these flies? So to um, help identify these. I mean, they, these can look fairly similar to other types of flies, uh, but these are relatively small, about five millimeters long, and that, but they can stay on an animal for long periods of time. And they generally associate with the um, animal for most of its adult life. And they generally cluster on the head, shoulders, and back, uh, but they will sometimes go on the belly, especially on warmer days. Um, they're kind of a um, charcoal gray and so the wings um, will remain partially open one of the identifying features that kind of remain uh, uh, looks like a V shape and so when they get to large fairly large numbers of flies per animal uh, something like 200 300 flies um, and they could bite uh, something 40 times a day so this is a constant irritation and when you have that many flies, um, you can really get a lot of uh, changes in feeding behavior and a real reduction in uh, weight gain. So we'll just uh, move, give an example here of um, so a video showing some of the uh, behavior in response to uh, horn flies. Now if I can switch to the video. All right. So I just wanted to show here, this kind of um, various um, behaviors that indicate irritation by the flies and infest fly infestations. So you see bunching of the cattle, even in open space, uh, the tail swishing, um, stomping. And uh, um, if you look really closely, possibly some ear flicks. Um, so other types of flies can sometimes cause this reaction but, and, and behavior. So it's really important to uh, confirm what type of fly it is. But this is typical of what you'd see with um, uh, horn fly um, 
irritation infestations. Now this behavior can signify um, uh, a real pest infestation that can lead and uh, to significant loss. So, uh, Sean, we're seeing your speaker notes. Okay, sorry. I will get this. All right, is that better? That's better. All right. So when you have um, previous studies have shown that uh, even up to 100 flies on an average on a cow can really lead to significant reduction in um, weight gain. Um, and we've, people have seen up to 16% uh, reduction over the, uh, over the grazing period. And, uh, and in yearlings, same thing, up to 18% reduction in weight gain. And so, of course, this could also affect uh, calves um, because uh, reduce, uh, with reduced weaning weights um, by up to 16% due to the reduction in milk production. And so some studies have shown calves that have been 10 to 20% uh, heavier from when you uh, treat your cattle. Um, for horn fly infestations. So to, when you wanna consider uh, treatments, looking at the, you really wanna consider the life cycle of these flies. Um, so they were associated with very fresh dung where the adults lay the eggs of, and this is dung of grass fed cattle. Um, so really is control a method should be based on this life cycle and understanding this. And any methods that kind of um, will disturb dung pats should be effective for fly control on pasture. Um, this is also true for other flies like base flies because they have a similar life cycle and associated with uh, cattle and uh, grass fed, uh, and dung from grass fed cattle. And so when you're also evaluating some of your uh, options for control, uh, there are a few different ones that may uh, be appropriate. Uh, we have physical and cultural, under the physical and cultural um, category, there are some traps that have been uh, developed and it, uh, it's like uh, this particular one that's shown on the screen where it's actually a vacuum type uh, walkthrough trap that uh, sucks up flies and works uh, quite well showing 30% reduction, 30 to 70% reduction in horn flies on cattle. Um, also, any trampling or breakdown of dung um, would be effective at, uh, um, at uh, reducing uh, fly populations. Um, so possibly increasing uh, cattle density could affect uh, horn fly populations. And, uh, but, some studies so really need to uh, study that to understand whether or not different um, uh, grazing methods may uh, improve um, or reduce horn fly populations. Um, we also have biological control. Um, really, one of the main considerations there is allowing really the natural enemies and natural pests of horn flies to do their job, such as dung beetles, which break down manure pats. Um, and also, you do find that some birds, like ducks and chickens, um, will actually eat larvae out of the dung pats. That may not be suitable on a large scale, but uh, um, they do work in a small scale. Um, of course, chemical control, um, there's a variety of uh, options with uh, sprays, porons, uh, ear tags, uh, rubbers, oilers, uh, dust bags, or even feed throughs, which um, insecticides that will actually end up in the dung, of course, and then um, uh, reduce 
fly populations also affecting the, the larvae in the dung. Now one of the other um, ectoparasites found in field uh, situations, pasture and rangeland are uh, ticks. Uh, in Canada we have three species that uh, can be important including the American dog tick, Rocky Mountain wood tick, and uh, the winter tick or the moose tick. Um, there are also a couple species that we're kind of keeping an eye on that are important in the United States and are uh, moving northward. So we, these are uh, the Lone Star Tick and the Asian Longhorn Tick. And if these do get into Canada and they do have um, um, potential for significant and direct impact on livestock production, whether it's just uh, direct impact or even um, some disease transmission possibility, um, these three species that we have in Canada right now, they can be vectors and transmit disease, including anaplasmosis. And some places, uh, the Rocky Mountain wood tick cause paralysis in, in parts of British Columbia. And um, they can all be a pest and really cause irritation and, and um, blood loss. And for some species of tick, um, um, like the Lone Star tick, people have shown actual production losses also uh, and cattle and uh, reduced weight gain. And right now we don't really know the effect of uh, dog ticks or winter ticks um, on weight gain um, in Canada. So that would be, that's a question that we still have and be worth looking into. And if there's um, need for control of ticks, uh, there are a few options. Um, where when you look at uh, cultural and physical uh, type control. Um, a lot of it has to do with uh, keeping ticks away from um, areas that are favorable or really ticky where there's a lot of ticks there um, during the period of adult tick activity, which can be anywhere from the end of March to uh, very beginning of July, end of June, depending on the ticks and where you are in the country. Um, you can also look at uh, vegetation management, so reducing a suitable habitat for ticks. Um, and uh, pasture spelling, so leaving an area clear, uh, uh, keeping animals out of a certain pasture for a while. And uh, biological control, unfortunately, is not an option that's really viable right now. There are some studies where we're looking at um, uh, fungal pathogens that do uh, kill ticks, but uh, application on a large scale may be difficult. And um, also birds, some birds will eat uh, ticks, which may be you know, useful on a relatively small scale, but um, they have been studied in certain situations. Uh, of course, chemical control is uh, mainly what the uh, uh, main method of uh, tick control. Those include sprays and porons. And for the winter tick, um, which is mainly a problem um, in the uh, winter, very early spring, we're looking at dust. Um, environmental application of insecticides have been used, but that's not really recommended due to contamination, environmental contamination and non-target effects on uh, uh, other insects. So I'll pass it over to Katrin and she'll start talking about uh, other aspects, other insects and other aspects of uh, control. Thank you, Sean. So let's try this and see if I can make this work. Here's a, here's a presentation. So what do you see right now? Because I can't see. Uh, white screen right now. White screen. Excellent. That's what we want. So um, there you go. So I'm going to continue and I'll be focusing mo more on the confined systems. So as Sean men mentioned previously, we have, um, we have stable flies uh, and house flies that can be uh, problems and then of course lice. So I'll continue on this idea of um, going through our steps of IPM. So you need to assess your population. Um, what do you have? What's causing a problem? So are you noticing uh, behaviors? So animals are rubbing or stomping. Um, do you actually see the pest? 
that's always very important. Uh, when you see it, it's a lot easier to identify. So we'll start with uh, our uh, stable flies and, uh, and house flies, mostly because they develop in the same environment and you expect house flies and stable flies um, in, the, in um, confined production. They, um, they develop really well in uh, manure that's coming from animals that are fed uh, concentrated feed and other decaying mat materials. So you have that um, in the image here where um, you have stable fly pupae. So essentially um, this, uh, this stage here just before the adult comes out. So you have this um, in the hay rings. So just the area around hay rings um, and that's they're really, really good for um, stable fly development and also um, house flies as well. Now, they're not super easy to tell apart when they're all resting on fences or walls. Um, we'll start with the house fly. I think everybody's familiar with the house fly. Um, they, um, they're about six to nine millimeters long. When you see them from the side, they have this sort of creamy abdomen and they're just, they're just a real nuisance. Uh, they're really good at moving pathogens around, um, but they're really mostly annoying and they can build up to pretty large uh, populations. Um, stable flies, uh, they're a tiny bit smaller. They have these black spots on the abdomen, um, which can help um, telling them apart, but they have these pointy mouth parts here because they bite and it's a very painful bite. And this bite um, is really the problem. It causes irritation. The animals bunch together um, to try and reduce access um, uh, to them. So the flies don't attack them, they attack the neighbor. Um, and they can, again, like uh, horn flies, they'll reduce weight gains, uh, reduced feed conversion. And so if you look at the graphs here, um, on the bottom axis here, you have the number of flies per front leg. The stable flies really like legs, as you can see here. And so that's how we assess the abundance of the population. You look at the number of flies on front legs. And uh, here you have your reduction in, in feed efficiency. So even when you get to numbers like, you know, about 10 or so flies per leg, um, you get an 8% reduction in your feed efficiency. Same thing here in your, uh, in your gain reduction. So at very low numbers, you can get an 8% reduction um, at low numbers. An animal with this many flies on this one leg um, is you're losing, uh, you're losing a lot. Um, so the threshold is you wanna keep your losses fairly low. So the th threshold for stable flies would be um, about four flies per front leg. And one of the reasons we use front legs is because in a confined system, uh, it's easier to see animals uh, lined up so you can actually see what their uh, front legs look like. Um, there's different options for, um, for control. Sanitation is really important. Obviously, if you have something that's developing in manure um, and uh, manure that's mixed with um, other uh, plant material, then destroying that and removing that uh, becomes key. Now you want to clean up spilled uh, silage. House flies in particular really like to develop uh, in anything that's spoiling like that. Um, they like the manure and the whole mix to be nice and wet um, and damp. So drainage becomes important. If you can dry things out, uh, you, can, you can do quite well. And there are traps that exist um, for both uh, house flies and stable flies that you can use. Uh, biological control, again, um, you can use parasitoid wasps. You can buy them and you can release them and they go and they lay an egg in the pupa. The key thing though, is that you can't do only that. You have to do that biological control with sanitation. Um, and then the argument is, well, if I'm putting all this time and investment in sanitation, do I really need the parasitoids? They do work, they do help but you can't just release them and hope they do the work, that doesn't work. Um, and again, as Sean mentioned, uh, ducks and chickens actually really do like uh, to eat maggots and they'll go and peck them out. Um, they are more, effect more effective than uh, traps, um, but obviously not necessarily applicable on large scales. Um, but if, you know, the nice thing, I guess, if you get the, the ducks is that they're kind of tasty too.
so you can eat the ducks after at the end of the season. Um, and then of course, chemical options. Uh, direct sprays uh, have really limited use against stable flies, uh, partly because um, they like to stay on the legs and the legs do get dirty and wet um, and a lot of the product does rub off very quickly. So it would be a relief, but not real control. Uh, you can use baits for house flies. Um, and since both flies like to rest on uh, vertical surfaces, uh, you could use a residual insecticide on walls um, so that when they go and rest, um, they will, they, they'll get a dose and then they'll, they'll die. Um, oh, and I forgot I had this. Um, this is an example here um, of the number of flies, uh, number of flies here on a, um, a farm where there's no cleaning of the manure. And in this one here, um, they did the cleaning uh, every two weeks until August. And you can see that there's about a 50% a or so reduction um, in the number of uh, stable flies per front legs on the farm where there's cleaning compared to one where there's not regular cleaning. Uh, so really sanitation is key if that's what you want to control, if you want to control those stable flies. Another problem is lice. Um, so again, you want to make sure that um, you know exactly what you're dealing with. Lice can cause extreme annoyance. Uh, they can cause uh, allergic reactions. And you'll see the animals that are rubbing and licking and scratching. Uh, and that can lead to hair loss and high damage. Um, and the animals are really stressed. And then they waste all this energy um, scratching. And so they'll have reduced weight gain and reduced production. Um, now, it's easy to assume that an animal that's scratching and losing hair has lice. But it's really essential to be able to see the problem, to see the lice. Uh, so you need to check those animals and make sure that's the problem. Um, you know, it could be, it could be mites uh, that you won't see. Uh, lice, you can see them. They're like two or three millimeters. You can see them. Um, it could be a nutritional issue. It could be something else. So you need, if, it, if you're going to treat for lice, you need to make sure you see them and you identify them. Um, and, you know, here's how. Um, you would um, take a comb and you, of course, you restrain the animals, and then you make uh, partings, and you actually look at um, the if you find lice um, along the along that part on the skin along that part, and there's specific areas on the animal where you should look, um, and the reason why you want to look in those areas is that we have four potentially four different species of lice, and they like to hang out in different places. Uh, and by following this method, uh, you're sure that you're going to all the preferred spots. Uh, we have uh, one species of chewing louse, the, this, the cattle biting louse. And um, they feed on, on hair and skin. So they don't feed on blood. They actually feed on the hair. Um, and then we have these three, um, three species of sucking lice. They're the ones that feed on blood. Um, the lice that feed on hair move around more, and the ones that feed on blood actually cause more of a problem. They can lead to anemia uh, and other problems. Um, and very often the bulls have more uh, lice in their carriers, uh, and they, they serve to uh, infest um, other animals. And so you'd want to, through following this, this sampling method, uh, you should be able to see the lice so that you can, uh, if you do have them, then you can control. Um, there are things you can do to prevent getting lice. What are the options? Well, when you first, you have to inspect any new animal that comes into the herd, isolate them and inspect them. Don't put them right in with the general population. We have that now with this coronavirus. People that come from outside, they have to quarantine themselves so they don't mingle with everybody else. Well, that's a basic biosecurity procedure. So when your animals come in, if you're worried about lice, don't mix them in, check first. Uh, when you do find in your herd any animals that are infested, keep those separate. So the ones that don't have lice um, are not in contact. Lice don't jump or fly, they're transferred through contact. Um, and so and that's partly why it's more of an issue in the winter because the animals are more uh, densely packed. They, there's more contact uh, between the animals. 
changes in the hair coat also have an effect, but really um, there's just, there's more contact. The lice can move around more. Um, you want to check regularly. Um, and if you have some of those animals that are chronically infested, they always have, they always end up with lice or they have way more than the others. You want to consider culling those animals. You don't want that in your stock. Um, so sometimes it's, it can be genetic. It could be uh, in their immune system. They just can't fight them off as well. So you, you, want to, you want to get rid of those. There are no biological control options for lice. Uh, and then chemicals, of course, you have dust and sprays and porons and you can use some systemics keeping in mind that um, systemics will be working for sucking lice only because the chewing lice don't feed on blood and so if a systemic will have the chemical in the blood um, and so only the ones that feed on blood will be affected by that now we get to that third step where you have to implement your control strategies um, so things to consider before treating, make sure that you know what you need to treat. So identify your pest, use more than one method, not only chemical. Um, the methods that you include in that toolkit, right? You want to make sure that you have things that suppress your population, that uh, keep everything low to begin with, if you can. Um, you want to make sure that you treat at the right time. So once you hit th the threshold, um, Always follow label directions, of course, um, and be aware of uh, resistance. Uh, try to do, don't do things that will lead to, to resistance. So we're gonna go into that. So what leads to resistance? Repeated use of the same active ingredient. Uh, that's one of the main things. So switching brand names doesn't mean that you're actually changing the active ingredient. You have to read the label and note the chemical that you're using and not use the same thing again. I, there's an example just here where I just went for um, ear tags and you have different brand names, but the active ingredient is here. Um, and so protector and optimizer is the same chemical. Uh, so switching between these two would dose your flies, your horn flies in this case that you're trying to control with exactly the same thing. So this is not uh, using something different, okay? Um, and then sometimes depending on the resistance that, that has built, um, your insect can be uh, resistant to things that have a similar mode of action. So insecticides are grouped by mode of action. So anything that's in 1B will have a similar mode of action. Uh, everything that's in group three uh, will have a similar mode of action. So you need to change the active ingredient, but you also need to switch between groups whenever you have the option. Um, you want to avoid um, anything that has too much of a decreasing concentration of insecticide over time. And unfortunately, that's one of the issues with ear tags. Um, it's a slow release formulation. So as you go in time, you get less and less of the chemical that's released. And then that leads to uh, dosing your pest with low, uh, too low of a concentration. Uh, and then pests that develop quickly tend to build resistance more quickly. So what can you do? You want to uh, alternate between your active ingredients and use different methods of application as well. Um, rotate between the poron and the ear tags. Uh, read those labels. Keep really good records of what active ingredients you're using, uh, what you've used in the past so that, because you won't remember, right? Was it this year or that year that I used this? Keep good records. Don't repeat the same thing over and over again. Um, and try to avoid those low concentration. Apply the recommended dose. Um, if you're using ear tags, uh, don't tag before the flies have arrived. Don't tag before you reach that threshold uh, because you don't need to be releasing insecticide in the environment and on your animal if there are no flies to fight. That leads to decreased and low concentrations much sooner than you need. Um, and always uh, use the recommended rates. So at the end, you need to make sure after you've treated, well, did it work? Um, because so you need to check uh, and reassess if, if your pests are coming back, perhaps what you can do the same thing, uh, use a different chemical, 
Um, and if things are not working, then you need to reassess. And that's when um, you, know, you can call in some experts and say, hey, I've tried this, I've done that, I've followed the labels, it didn't work. And then you can look into it and see um, exactly what, um, what's happening. So um, we need to know, to have better control, we need to know exactly the, um, the impact of the pest on the production on and on the animal. Um, some of, sometimes we have economic thresholds and sometimes we don't. So that's really important information uh, to figure out. Uh, there's been a lot of changes also in uh, practices, farming practices, and um, even in the animals, or at the animals that we have now are different from the animals that were uh, around 30 years ago when a lot of the research was done on thresholds. So, uh, you know, we might need, uh, some updates uh, there um, and really looking at the new practices that we have, how are they affecting uh, pest population and can we, can we improve on that? Um, and all of this really is to support better decision making so that you can have um, effective control. Key points, make sure you know what you're fighting. You need to identify your pest properly. Um, use a variety of methods uh, to prevent pests and to control them. Uh, and make sure that the methods that you're using are appropriate for what you're trying to fight, the right timing, the right product delivered properly. Thank you. We'll take questions. Excellent. So if you have any questions for Karen or Sean, um, you can enter those into the Q&A box. It should be located either at the bottom or the top of your screen. Um, I think I'll get started with a couple of questions that we have. Um, I know there's a lot of questions around ibomec and ivermectin not always working effectively. Um, I know you'd mentioned a little bit about how to avoid that, but you, could you kind of reiterate how you can um, get around issues with products like ivermectin um, resistance and things like that? Sure. So um, when when um, avermectins came in, so Ivomec and others, um, it's kind of a silver bullet, right? It does everything. It controls all your internal parasites and then you get uh, horn fly control on bonus and then uh, lice and everything. So it's, it's easy to, to use that uh, and use only that. Um, it's convenient, but again, using always the same uh, active ingredient, always using the same thing leads to resistance. So uh, it's possible that resistance develops when you use only that. Um, now, when a treatment doesn't work, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's resistance. Um, it's one possibility, uh, but there could be other things. Um, sometimes things aren't applied in the most ideal conditions. Um, if you're treating animals um, and it may be too early, uh, then you don't get the control when you need it. Um, if it's very cold outside and your product freezes, uh, either in the delivery gun or on the animal, then again, you won't have the most effective uh, dose and the most effective treatment. So sometimes it's not automatically um, resistance. Uh, sometimes it's just other factors that are around that make the, the treatment ineffective. Um, and so this is, a, it's a case by case basis, um, but you have to really look into it and say, okay, have I followed everything properly? Um, and if you're not, if you're not, don't have a rotation, um, then that can lead to problems. Okay. And we got another question that's kind of along the same line. Um, would you use a different effort different active ingredient every time, every second time, how often would you uh, do a rotation of the active ingredients? Well, normally the, the recommendation would be to change it every time, um, but you can have, obviously you're going to run out after a while, right? So you, you can have a rotation of two or three, ideally three or four, uh, but in certain systems, what is available is limited. Um, and so you would have, you would do a rotation like that. Um, there's some, uh, sometimes you can mix both. So for example, some of the newer ear tags will have two 
uh, different groups in it. So an organophosphate and a pyrethroid, for example. Um, and so, so you could uh, do something like that. And against lice, for example, you could do your um, Ivomec treatment. You would do it usually late fall, early winter. And then if you have problems that come up later in the winter, um, then you could use uh, your pyrethroid, for example. So then you, would, you wouldn't do Ivomec again, right? So you would do your, your rotation like that. So I would say when you need to treat, um, do your rotation right away and keep track. Excellent. Okay. This one's an interesting one. Is there any scientific truth about mixing garlic powder with loose blue salt for insect control on cattle? And either one of you feel free to answer that one. Well, it's not like I didn't anticipate that. <laughs> or Sean, for that matter. Um, so as far as science goes, the question is, is there any scientific evidence? There is no scientific evidence that it works. Um, there's, there's articles that have come out, there's anecdotal um, evidence of people that have tried it, they swear by it, they say it works. Um, but as far as science goes, which means having uh, well-designed experiments that are replicated, that are validated, that are uh, looked over by peers, um, essentially just try to, we try to poke through everything we do and then if it survives the poking through, then it gets published. Um, in the published literature right now, there's nothing that says that it works. Okay, is there an option to control hatching on open water sources like ponds if the cattle drink from that water source as well? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, if I mean for for mosquito control, for example, I think you can use something like BT or something like like some of the biological control. But other than that, I'm not sure if that's what the question was about. I think, but by hatching, that's what I understand. That would be mosquitoes. Um. Okay. Uh, any thoughts from you, Sean? No, I don't have anything to add to that, too. I'd have to definitely look it up so we can get back. Okay, we got a comment from someone that says S. Metoprene is used in water sources in the U.S. as an insect growth regulator. Mm -hmm. so whether that's still safe for cattle to drink or not? Well, um, yes. So there are things that, are, that you can do in the U.S. that you can't, but metoprene is used um, already as a feed-through in um, Altosid, for example. Um, so it could be safe. Now, I again, you'd have to follow... The, um, you'd have to follow the label recommendation. Um, certain for formulations, you know, it's not because you have a certain product, so you have methoprene and altosid that you can spray that somewhere where it's not meant to go, for example. So, um, but an, an, uh, a growth regulator might be something you can put in. I don't know if you can do that here. But yeah, that's a good point. And IGR is something that might work. Mm -hmm. uh, do ear tags work effectively for lice in the winter? I don't think that, um, don't think of any, I don't think there's any ear tags that are actually registered against lice. Um, there's a difference between things that work and things that you can use to do something. So that would be using, for example, using the product for something it's not meant for. Um, but I don't, I don't know of anything that's been done that would show this works well or should be done at all. 
Uh, is there any chemical control for ticks? There, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> there are some options for ticks. Um, a lot of them are uh, either porons or sprays. Uh, there's some permethrin-based ones, or um, uh, some lambda, say, say hold high <laughs> uh, and um, those are should be effective against the wood ticks, dog ticks. Um, of course, again, and checking the labels on those. Um, and then winter tick had some questions about uh, winter tick on various types of animals before, um, but of course the time year where those are a problem is winter and uh, time where it's not good to use liquids. So, um, but there are I think powder, um, some dust uh, options, um, some I think and carbaryl I think is one option for winter ticks also. I think there are some uh, liquid options too that can be used earlier on. Uh, that tick stays on an animal for almost, the tick's almost uh, almost its complete life cycle. So when people notice them, it's usually later on in the life cycle in the winter, but um, they will be on an animal uh, in the fall as larvae that are really small. So um, treatment at that time might work. Okay, um, just one more question here. Uh, how effective are cattle oilers that have insecticide topped off with diesel fuel? If you've ever heard of that one. Yes, um, so using um, any petroleum product, diesel is being the most common um, as a carrier, so small amounts as a carrier um, would have no uh, no ill effect on the cattle and might actually help uh, some of the, the distribution of some of the, uh, the chemical with a small amount. Um, using a lot or using only diesel um, is a bad idea because it is a toxic material. Uh, so a small amount as carrier is, there's, there's no ill effect, um, but using a lot um, and use it or using only that, um, that can have, uh, that can be detrimental. It can have uh, serious skin issues. Um, it's toxic. So something to consider, uh, it's a small amount. That's it. Okay. Um, just one more question that I thought of. When should we be treating for different parasites? Is this something we should be constantly monitoring or are there different times of the year that we should be looking? Um, when should producers be thinking about um, treating uh, for parasites? Well, um, for example, when we have our timeline that we, uh, you know, we prepared, so um, some, some insects, so some pests will be overwintering so as soon as the snow is off, uh, they're adults, they're ready. Ticks, for example, you know, snow melts, ticks are out. Um, so that's when you start to monitor when the pest is active. Um, stable flies, depending on where you are in the country, um, in uh, Manitoba, they'll start, May, like when we set traps out, like mid-June, end of June, they'll start to come up. In Alberta, I think it's, it's earlier, Sean, isn't it? For stable flies, they show up earlier, I think. Um, Just a little bit earlier, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, so that's when you would start, uh, you know, you're like, okay, that's when you'd start to monitor. You can set traps if, if you don't know. Um, so just you get a feel for what comes in and what comes out. You look at your, you look at the cattle, you see when the numbers come up, but um, I mean that uh, that chart that we have. If you rewatch the video, you could take a screenshot, or we could probably give it to you as a uh, as a resource. Um, keeping in mind that this is very general, and for a certain area, you might want to uh, uh, you might might want to just check around those dates. So uh, that's how I would uh, that's how I would answer that. Just 
different, know which time of the season the pests are supposed to come out. Uh, if you're not sure, ask a specialist. Uh, they'll tell you. And, um, and then you can check for some behavior. And uh, if you want it, we always talk about traps. As an entomologist, we I, I like traps. We like to trap things and then look at them. Um, but, you know, when it's horsefly season, I know of producers who will put out uh, horsefly traps um, and then they say they just love to, you know, go by the trap uh, and then look at all the flies that are dying. Um, so, you know, it can also be entertainment, I guess. And then you have a trap and you can know when the flies are out. All right, perfect. So just a couple of things before we let everybody go. One is how to get more information and science-based production advice through the BCRC. You can visit our website, beefresearch.ca, and click the subscribe button to sign up for our free email list. You can also subscribe to our newsletter, The Wire. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube with the same uh, at Beef Research. Our next webinar is called Sprouting Technology. Uh, it'll be on Wednesday, March 25th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. The speakers will be Tamara Carter, Carter from the Saskatchewan Forage Council, uh, as well as Julia McKenzie and Tara Mulhern Davidson. You receive an email from me in a couple of days with the link to watch the recording, as well as links to some additional information on on external parasites, you'll also receive a link to a survey. If you can take a few minutes of your time to fill out the survey, it is very helpful for us when preparing for new webinars. And that's it. So thank you to, help, to you guys at home for joining us tonight. And on behalf of everyone at the BCRC, thank you to Katherine and Sean for taking the time to present to us this evening. And good night. Thanks, good night. <laughs>